Thank you guys so much. Hey, that sounds like Catholic Answers Live. I was about to say, welcome to the program. Well, it's good to be here, guys. And as I was telling uh, some of the fellas here, after I had my stroke four months ago, it's good to be anywhere, right? In fact, I've been down hard for the last four months. Last week was my first time speaking uh, at an event. And so, you know, I was really nervous last week because I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to remember stuff, you know? You kind of go over it in your mind and whatnot, but if any of you have ever had a stroke before, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I've, I've become Joe Biden. It's, uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, I do have that tendency to forget where I am and what, that sort of thing. Oh, I should, I'm gonna get hammered for that one, but that's all right. <laughs> but I do want, want to tell you guys, it, it's, it's really exciting to be here and just to be able to be out on the road. My wife is with me, you know, just watching out for me in the hotel and all that, just making sure we don't have any glitches. And every now and again, that's why we have the chair here. I can lose a little equilibrium, but I am getting better by the day. My therapist and my neurologist are saying that I'm recovering well. But again, guys, phenomenal. Yeah, phenomenal to be here. Real quick, by way of uh, commercial, want you guys to understand that I know the numbers are down post-COVID and all that, so that means you gotta buy twice as much, all right? <laughs> Dr. Ray and my stuff needs to all leave those tables, okay, before you guys leave. Uh, but I wanna mention, if you like to watch, listen, or read, I got you covered. So I got something for you out there. My conversion story is called Jimmy Swaggart Made Me Catholic. Now, I just believe you ought to get that just for the title. <laughs> for we older folks who remember who Jimmy Swaggart is, and, and I, I recommend the CD version. I have a DVD version, I have a written version, I have a uh, CD version. I recommend the CD because it's three hours. I get, I get to tell not only my story, but my whole family story, because as many of you know, when I converted to the Catholic faith, my Pentecostal family thought I was demonized. My brother Terry especially wanted to cast demons out of me. <laughs> He's now a Catholic priest, just so you know. Yeah. yeah, proof positive God has a sense of humor. But my mother, father, three brothers, two sisters-in-law, they're all Catholic now, and I tell the story, and Jimmy Swaggart made me Catholic. But I want to mention these. If you like to watch, I have kind of a part one, part two, why be Catholic, right? Now this, I, I want you to know, is only for atheists, agnostics, members of all the other world religions, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism. I got something for all of you in, in here. Also, if you're Orthodox, you need this. If you are a member of any of the Protestant denomination or cults, you need this. Uh, other than that, it's really not for anybody. Right? <laughs> but really, seriously, why be Catholic? I take you from no faith at all to the Catholic Church in an hour and 20 minutes. And then I have part two, defending your faith, that picks up where that one leaves off. And I basically defend Catholicism versus the many Protestant sects who deny the truth of the Catholic faith. So those are two DVDs I want to recommend to you guys. Also, now, if you like to listen, and I am one of those guys who still has a CD player. <laughs> I pop them in my car. But if not, of course, you can go to catholic.com. We have everything digital as well. But I brought some CDs with me for you old-timers like me who still have CD players. Um, Sword of the Spirit. This is about seven hours of teaching. This is a, more like a course on biblical apologetics. I tackle the six most important topics in biblical apologetics. You got to take a look by it to find out what they are. All right. 
Also, Catholic answers to common objections. I tackle 20 of the most common and some of the most difficult questions folks ask. Why are you Catholic? So those are a couple of CD sets. And for books, I want to recommend Nuts and Bolts, a practical how-to guide to evangelism. I take you through 14 different scenarios, an atheist in a classroom setting, uh, a Jehovah's Witness at the door, a Mormon, an evangelical in a grocery store, and each one of those 14 chapters are based on actual conversations that I've had with real human beings. And also, and finally, Behold Your Mother, which is, as Father Mitch Pacwa, who wrote a blurb for, for it, says, Tim Staples respectfully but clearly answers every conceivable Protestant objection to Mary. I had to pay him a lot to say that. <laughs> so we got to recoup some of that money. No. It, it really is an exhaustive apologetic that deals with everything you can imagine with regard to the Blessed Mother. But I think most importantly of all, perhaps, is each one of the Marian doctrines, I show you why they matter spiritually for your life, including the perpetual virginity. I have a whole chapter called The Big Deal, Why the Perpetual Virginia Mary Matters for Your Spiritual Life. And that was inspired by a colleague of mine on EWTN who I happened to be watching one day, and he made this unfortunate statement. He said, in talking about Perpetual Virginia Mary, he said, well, this is an interesting dogma because this is one of those dogmas that has nothing to do really with your spiritual life. Yes, we are taking credit cards. <laughs> we got a credit card machine back there. Uh, we just got it, so uh, yes. But at any rate, he made that statement, and I'm watching EWTN. It's, it, you know, it really doesn't have anything to do with your spiritual life, but nevertheless. And you know what I said as I was sitting in my living room? I said, ah! You know, just about like that. Uh, <laughs> and I woke three guys up. Uh, <laughs> because as many of you know, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 89, tells us that there is an organic connection between our spiritual lives and the dogmas. That means all of them, <laughs> all right? If our spiritual lives are upright, we will be opening, open and welcoming to receiving the dogmas, and the dogmas impact our spiritual lives. There's a reciprocating relationship. And it, it, notice the Catechism doesn't say, doesn't say everything except the perpetual Virginia Mary. So I, I really do think, and, and we've sold a, a whole lot of these books over the years, and it's amazing how many Catholics as well as Protestants have, have told me they have never seen some of the stuff we put in there. But we've got more stuff back there, guys. I just wanted to share those few, and now it's time to have some fun. If I can make it through this talk. <laughs> if I fall, will you help me up? That's all I'm asking. All right. And if I fall asleep, just wake me up. All right. These things happen. But at any rate, let me start with a question. I'm going to make three simple points in this presentation with you gentlemen. And number one, for those of you that are taking notes, I'm going to ask you a question. Why in the world did God create us? In fact, why did he create? Because think about this, guys, something to ponder. God exists from all eternity, three persons, in an infinite, perfect circle of love beyond anything we can imagine, right? Father pouring himself out into the Son, Son back into the Father, Father and Son into the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit back into the Father and the Son in an infinite, perfect circle of love that is so infinitely perfect, we will never in a trillion years in heaven be able to come close to comprehending this love. God was absolutely complete. You ever met the guy that's really hard to get something for for Christmas? You know, really, t God. You know what? This is the guy who's got everything, all right? You can't add anything to God. There's nothing we can give to God. Even our response in grace to his grace 
is a gift first and foremost, right? As St. Augustine famously say, if you and I endure to the end and we are saved, our salvation ultimately will be God crowning his own gifts. We can't give God anything that he doesn't already have because he gave it to you first. Amen? Amen. And yet God, who is absolutely complete, whoop, there we go, and infinitely so, it feels like I'm surfing sometimes. <laughs> he is infinitely complete. We can add nothing to him decided to create. Now, folks, again, the question is why? Because God knows when he creates, that creation can add nothing to him. Why do you do it? And let's add this to the equation. Not only can that creation God's about to create do absolutely nothing for him, but God knows that one day that creation will kill him. But he creates anyway. See, I'm sorry, guys. If I'm God, I ain't doing it. <laughs> hey, I like you a lot, all right? <laughs> but I'm not doing it. I'm sorry. And yet God does. And how can we comprehend this? Well, the only answer ultimately, now in our Catholic theology, we know God created for his own glory or for the glory of God, right? And it's better to say for the glory of God. It's not that God is on an ego trip, right? Oh, I just got to show my glory. No, it's really so that you and I can participate in his glory and in that reality manifest his glory to this universe of ours. But you know what? Ultimately, yes, he created to manifest his glory, but ultimately the answer is love. Amen? Ultimately, that's the answer to the first question, why did God create? It's because of love. What is the definition of love, gentlemen? We all know, right? St. Thomas Aquinas so beautifully defines it as the willing of the good of the other. Amen? Amen. That is love pours... In fact, I like St. Paul's definition even better. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, St. Paul says, you know, he gives a litany of little definitions of love. But in verse 5, he says, love considers not its own interests. Amen? Love pours itself out. What's your name? Dan. Dan. Love pours itself out without asking for anything in return. Oh my goodness, where did we go wrong in this culture of ours, right? Whitney Houston, God rest her soul. <laughs> Y'all remember, because the greatest. Oh my Lord, that's a disgusting song. Okay, the woman can sing. She can sing. But oh my goodness, the greatest love of all is easy to receive. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Folks, that's not love. That's narcissism. <laughs> and this is what we are producing in our culture, is a culture of narcissists who are defining love as narcissism. Talk to young people today who have been just brainwashed now for decades in our schools. How that ultimately the end of all things is yourself and just how wonderful you are. Now, uh, uh, Dan, right? Your name? Ivan. Ivan, you ain't all that much. All right? Dan, same. All right? Yes, we're creating the image and likeness of God, but where have we gone as a culture to where the individual becomes the end all and be all. Do you want to know a good definition of that, Ivan? It's called hell. Because ultimately, that is what hell is. Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1033, says what? Hell is by definition the definitive self exclusion, right? Of a person from communion with God and the saints. That's what hell is, you for all eternity, amen? Just me, 
Oh my gosh, do you know we are so made for communion. They say that if a baby is born, and unfortunately this happens in our, as Pope Francis calls it, the throwaway culture. In our throwaway culture, Laudato Si, beautiful document by the way. The throwaway culture where we throw away babies. They say if you set a baby, a brand new baby, aside and leave it to die, it will go insane before it even dies of starvation, or actually first it would be dehydration. Hey, uh, a, a little uh, word to the wise, always turn your phone off before you talk. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Why? Because we are so made for communion, and in fact, I'm going to add something here. I want to take this now from why did God create to point number two. And point number two, I want to define for us something else really important. What does it mean to be a man, number one? And what does it mean to be a father? Right. Because the Catechism of the Catholic Church says this in paragraph 239. It says that in revealing himself as father, God reveals two essential things about himself. Number one, that God is the transcendent authority and first cause. Now, I know the Catechism says first origin. I'm desperately Thomist, so I will say instead of first origin, first cause. And of course, it means the same thing. But God is the transcendent authority. That is, he's outside, we're not pantheists. Amen? The creation ain't us. <laughs> Sorry to my Hindu friends and my Mahayana Buddhist friends. No, pantheism is crazy. You know what? Can I get back and pick on Dan a little bit more? Because pantheism is, is kind of crazy, Dan, in that, you know, and, and why Catholics involve themselves in the insanity of centering prayer and these Eastern nonsense stuff? Why do you want to go there? You know, the whole idea of you being God. Dan, if you're God, as Father Thomas Keating says, right, the first uh, principle of the spiritual life is to recognize there is an other. By the way, I'm not recommending Father Thomas Keating. He's nuts. But the first principle of the spiritual life is there is an other. And that's true. Amen. There is an other. God. Second principle. Our end, our aim should be to be one with the other. Woo! Two for two. Way to go, Father Keating. The problem comes in in the third point. <laughs> and the third principle of the spiritual life is to recognize that there is no other. You are the other. That's just warmed over Hinduism, Mahayana Buddhism, and the bottom line is, Dan, if you're God, then God is pretty stupid. Wouldn't you say, Dan? <laughs> All right. Yes! If I'm God, God is pretty stupid. No, we are not God. God is the transcendent authority that is outside. He creates something that's not himself. Amen? Thanks be to God. He creates... The transcendent authority and first cause of all things. Now I'm going to focus there just for this second point because this is really important le leading into, you can say it, Tim, leading into uh, point number three. And that is, as first cause, we all know that God is the uncaused cause. Amen? In fact, I heard, Val, you, you will appreciate this. A friend of mine who I have to work on, who shall be nameless, <laughs> the other day made, made the statement, a, a, a young child asked the question, you know, why did God create Adam if he knew Adam was going to fall? Why did he create the devil if he knew the devil was going to fall? And this fellow brilliantly said, well, maybe God didn't know. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> wrong answer. All right, no. Because, folks, if anything outside of God causes God to do anything, you're not talking about God anymore. Amen? He is the uncaused cause. We, can't, we don't cause God to do anything. He causes us. 
right? But as the uncaused cause, the unmoved mover, without getting into all that beautiful Thomistic metaphysics, what we can say real simple is this, and this is the infallible teaching of the church. God is uncaused. He is pure act. That is, He is pure actuality. Amen? There's no potency in God. In fact, here's a cool little point, Ivan, about God. Did you know that God, in His divine essence, can't walk from here to there? Now, I'm not talking about our incarnate Lord, smarty pants. That gets into a whole nother discussion, doesn't it? But God, in His divine essence, He can't, Ivan, He can't walk from here to there. You know why? Because He's already there. Amen? And you need to get rid of this thing. <laughs> All right. No, he can't come to know something that he doesn't know. Why? Because he already knows it. He can't create something that has the ability to teach him something. Amen. God doesn't. Aren't you glad that when something goes haywire, let's say you have a stroke in your life, you, you know, God's not up there going, I'm so sorry, Tim. I didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> if that's true, we might as well throw in the towel, folks. No, God is in charge. He is God. He is pure actuality. But here, here is the interesting point that's going to be so important moving forward. As such, God can't receive. Now, hold on, you say, but we say receive our prayers, right? What are you talking about, Tim? Hold on a minute. He can't receive in the sense of receiving something he doesn't already have. Amen? All right, now, why is this important? God cannot receive. Back to the definition of Father in the Catechism, paragraph 239. He is the transcendent authority and first cause of all things, right? As pure actuality, uncaused cause, he cannot receive. What God does from all eternity, as we learned in part one, and in a sense, this is all God can do. He loves! That's what he does. In fact, that's who he is from all eternity. Pours himself out. And you know what's interesting is in the revelation of the Trinity, we've come to know how that is true. Because if you notice, Islam never says God is love. Amen? Did you know the Old Testament never says God is love? It says God loves, but never God is love. Why? Because in order to love, there has to be a beloved. If God is a solitary in a strict sense, as a Unitarian believes, how can he be love? Well, that's why you don't have the revelation of love in any world religion other than Christianity. Amen? Because we know from all eternity he pours himself out infinitely, as I said, Father into the Son, Son back into the Father, Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit back into the Father and the Son. Pouring themselves out in an infinite act of love. All right? That's God. In fact, there's a wonderful book by a guy you all have heard of. Cardinal Ratzinger? Have you heard of him? All right? It's called Eschatology. It's the, I, it, my book, the best book ever written on the topic. It's phenomenal. He wrote it back when he was Cardinal uh, Ratzinger. But in, in talking about this, how that God pours himself out from all eternity, Ratzinger makes the connection between the creation and the redemption. Because think about it. In the creation, what does God do? He just does what he does. He pours himself out in an infinite act of love without expecting anything in return, as we mentioned in point one, right? Creating, knowing that creation would one day kill him. So then after he creates, what does he do? He continues to pour himself out. As Cardinal Ratzinger says in that book, it's called redemption. Amen? He continues to pour himself out, and in Jesus Christ, we have the ultimate example of God, because he is God manifest in the flesh. And what does Jesus Christ do? Oh, fathers, hang in there. I'm going to slap you silly in a little bit. Ah, but it's going to be good. 
What does Jesus do? My favorite pericope in all of St. Paul, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 10. Remember St. Paul says, Christ, who though he was in the form of God, in forme theu, which basically means he's God. Right? In the form. Well, though he was in the form of, sorry to my Jehovah's Witness friends, yes, that's what it means. He's God. Though being in the form of God, thought is equality with God, not something to be clung to, but he emptied himself, taking upon himself the form of a slave. A doulos. I'll give you homework. Read Deuteronomy chapter 15 and learn about the bond slave. In fact, that word, doulos, there comes right out of Deuteronomy 15, the bond slave. The idea of the bond slave in the Old Testament. Remember, slavery in an Old Testament setting is more like a penitentiary system. You know, if you owed somebody and you didn't pay, you became a slave. But the cool thing about that slave system, it wasn't anything like the chattel slavery that was created in 1404 in the Canary Islands and became something that slavery had never been in the history of mankind. The, the evil that would come to our shores here in, in the United States. No, the slave owner had a responsibility to take care of the slave. Check this out. This ain't a bad deal. You had a, for that bond slave, you have, he's with you for six years, and in those six years, if he doesn't have a trade, you need to teach him a, a trade. You need to educate him and be sure that in the seventh year, year of Jubilee, the seventh year, he will be able to go free and establish himself and a family. Right? That's slavery. Doesn't sound like slavery we had here, does it? Right? But at the end of that seven years, if the slave had grown to love his master and didn't want to leave, there was a little liturgical ritual they did. You guys ever heard this? You go to the door of the slave owner's house, and the slave presents his ear, and the slave owner draws, uh, uh, drives an owl. Uh, uh, it's actually an awl, A-W-L, an awl, like a stave through the ear and into the door. And the blood that is shed is a sign of the covenant, and he is the slave of that owner forever. That's the image Jesus gives us. The New Testament gives us. Jesus, St. Paul says, though he's in the form of God, thought his equality with God, not something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking upon himself the form of a slave. And he would not just allow an all through his ear. We're talking about the crucifixion, my friend. But here, this is the image. Took upon himself the form of a slave and being found, check this out, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself even unto death, death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him and has given him a name above every name. That at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bend, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In essence, as Cardinal Ratzinger points out, what we're talking about here is God acting like God. That's what he does from all eternity. All he does is pour himself out, not asking for anything in return. And so in the incarnation, what do we see? Love manifest in the flesh. And what does Jesus do? He pours himself out as St. Irenaeus, perhaps got a little exaggerated on this point, but I love St. Irenaeus. Thank God Pope Francis made him a doctor of the church. That was overdue in my book. But St. Irenaeus, you know, famously talks about basically how Christ saved us in the incarnation. He didn't need to do anything else. Now, of course, we'd have to tweak that a little bit because given the revelation that we have received, Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Given the revelation we've received, more is necessary. But Irenaeus is right. In the abstract, we would have to have a different revelation than the one we have. I hope I'm not boring you guys yet, okay? <laughs> but it is true, as the Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us, and I'm going to give you another homework assignment. You've got to read paragraph 517 and paragraph 521. In the catechism, guys, it'll be worth your while. The catechism points out how, you know, when I was a Protestant, uh, we used to believe that Jesus did it all on the cross. Glory to God. Forgive me, I'm going to get into my Jimmy Swaggart here. 
Glory to God. He did it all on the cross. Glory to God. Well, and, of course, there is some truth there because, of course, the pinnacle of the redemption occurred on the cross. Absolutely. But as the catechism points out so beautifully, and gentlemen, this is going to be so important. You wait till we get to point three. What's your name? Vernie? Oh, Bernie. Bernie. When we get to point three, it's going to be so good. I wish I was sitting where you are so I could hear it. Do you understand? Yeah. <laughs> All right. But the catechism says and gives five texts, actually categories of texts there in the catechism showing how that Christ's entire life is redemptive, not just the cross. Every aspect of his life, gentlemen, this is going to be crucial for our spiritual lives as men and as fathers in particular. Every aspect of his life was salvific from the instant of his incarnation. In fact, the catechism lists first, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, where the scripture says, He became poor in order that we might be made rich. Referring to the Incarnation, what a deft use of that verse in that paragraph of the Catechism. You catch that? He became, he was made poor so that we might be made rich. And for my, uh, what do we call it, health and wealth gospel preachers, that's not talking about your wallet. Amen. He became, I heard this television preacher years ago, and I don't want to pick on anybody, so I won't name Creflo Dollar. I won't. But is that the best name for a TV preacher you ever heard? Creflo Dollar. But he was talking about that text, and he said, Jesus was made Pope so that we could be made rich. And then he said to his congregation, he said, And brothers, I am not ashamed to say I am loaded. <laughs> oh, I was like, yeah, because they're giving you all their money because they want to get loaded too. But anyway... No, this is not talking about your pocketbook. <laughs> he became poor so that we might be made rich, my friends, from the instant of the incarnation in his first human act. He began to redeem the world. And in fact, every human act of the second person of the Blessed Trinity merited infinitely. Inf he didn't merit just a lot. He merited infinitely. And he could do that. But wait a minute. He has a finite nature. How can he merit infinitely? Because of the hype. You guys didn't know you were going to get a theology lesson, did you? Right? But in Catholic theology, the hypostatic union is the answer. Because the human nature is joined in the hypostatic union to a divine person. Every act has as its subject a divine person. So he merits. Amen? He suffered. He died. But each one of those, he's, even though the subject technically of a human nature has as its subject a divine person. Oh, my Lord. This is why Pope Pius XII, in his masterpiece, Mystici Corporis of 1943, in paragraph 75, says that Christ knew and loved each one of us from the womb. Amen. He was, this is why, my friends, see, Christ had the beatific vision in his human nature from the instant of his incarnation. And by the way, that's the teaching of the church, my friend. This is not optional for Catholics. But that's the principle. Jesus has, in fact, here, the catechism of the Catholic Church, catch this, another homework assignment for you. In paragraph 478, that's section 478, the catechism says that Christ, during his passion, now Pius XII talks about in the womb, the catechism says during his passion, he knew and loved each one of us with a human heart. Amen. With a human heart. That is when he suffered and died during his passion. Dan, he saw you. He saw you, Ivan. He experienced in a mystical sense, we will never fathom this side of the veil or the other side of the veil. Never shall we fully be able to comprehend this. 
how that he experienced all the pain of millions of abortions, murders, you name it, in his human heart. In fact, some mystics say that Christ needed the ministry of angels, and of course we know he needed grace. Amen? You know that, right? In his human nature, he needed grace. You want to know why? Because Jesus was called to do something that human nature can't do. Even a perfect human nature cannot do on its own. That's why Jesus needed grace in his human nature. You say, what? What do you mean? Jesus? Yes. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, listen to this, y'all. It says that Christ in his suffering, think of this. God, who for the sake of all things, of the sake of all things and such, allowed the captain of our salvation to be perfected through suffering. That's Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. God allowed the perfection of the second person of the Blessed Trinity as human nature through suffering. Why? Look at verse 11. So that he is no longer ashamed to call us brethren. He suffers with us and for us. But notice how it says he was perfected through suffering. What? Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9 says, Christ, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience through the things that he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all those who would obey him. That's Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9. Did you catch that? He was perfected through suffering. It says that twice in the Bible there. Hebrews 2.10, Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. What in the world does that mean? I thought Jesus, Ivan, was already perfect. How did, why did he have to be perfected? Well, St. Thomas Aquinas tells us he was not perfected in the sense of moving from imperfection to perfection. No, that would be heresy. Amen? He is perfect, always perfect. However, he was called to transcend, as I said before, what even a perfect human nature could do, because he can't do it, by grace in order to fulfill his calling to go to the cross and to save the world. He needed grace. And so when we see the Catechism of the Catholic Church, we're going back, you thought I forgot. Paragraph 517, it says, Christ began to redeem us from the instant of his incarnation, right? He was made poor that we might be made rich in him. And it goes on, folks, to show how Christ continued to be perfected and to redeem us. The, the next uh, text is Luke chapter 2, verses 51 and 52. Remember when we had the finding in the temple? When Mary and Joseph lost Jesus for three days? You can imagine, oh my goodness, Mama is anxious. And they find him in the temple. And you all remember the story. Oh, I don't have time to get into that. Get my book, Behold Your Mother, because we have a ball with that in, in, in that book. But they find him. No, you're not. I'd be in my father's house or about my father's business. And remember what mama said? I'm not exactly sure what's going on here, but get your tail home. <laughs> right? And the scripture says he obeyed his parents, and thus he grew in age and wisdom and grace before God and men. What? Yes, he grew. And the catechism goes on to John chapter 15, verse 3, in the ministry of Jesus. Remember, he says to the apostles, you have already been made clean through my word. Wait a minute. Something going wrong here. How could they already been made clean? He hadn't died yet. Amen? I thought he did it all on the cross. No, they're already made clean, clean through his word. And then it's Matthew 8, 14 through 17, when Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. Are you all with me? You remember? After he heals Peter's mother-in-law, the scripture there, St. Matthew quotes Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 5, right? By his stripes we were healed. And he shows how that Christ is already healing 
before the cross. Amen? And that's not just physical healing. Physical healing is an external sign, a sacrament, if you will, of the spiritual healing he has come to give us. And then beautifully, of course, you have the cross. But let's skip over the cross to Romans chapter 4. This is so good. I guess it's because I'm an apologist. I get crazy about this because this is really good. But, you know, for those who say Jesus did it all on the cross, right? He, it is finished, brother. It is finished. You don't got to go to mass. You don't got to go to some crazy priest and confess your sin. It's finished. Just, just so folks know, point out to them, when Jesus says it is finished in John 19, 25 through 27, point out Jesus already told us what he finished in John 17. Just read the first few verses. He says, Father, I have finished that which you have given me to do in this life. Amen? It doesn't mean our salvation is finished, y'all. Are y'all with me? Oh, Lordy, we just getting started. Amen? <laughs> See, but that's a terrible, that's John Calvin at his worst. Luther fell to that same thing. Uh, we, we don't have time to get into that because Luther was confused. Anyway, here's the point. All right. Is that it ain't finished because Romans 4.25 says he was crucified for our sins. He was raised again for our justification. Amen? Well, if he was raised again for our justification, he wasn't raised on the cross. Amen? Amen. <laughs> All right. Why is this important? Because, folks, Jesus' entire life was redemptive. Every act, as I said, merited infinitely. This is why we can have devotion to our blessed Lord in the womb. Pope St. John Paul the Great had a great devotion to the infant of Prague. And by the way, it's not a, a young child. It's an infant. Amen? Pre what we would call the age of reason. That's the whole point. Well, that, that devotion doesn't make sense unless you understand that Christ had the beatific vision from the moment of his conception. And he did always behold his Father. And in fact, in, Rome, in John chapter 5, verse 19, y'all, this is too good. John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus says the Son of Man can do nothing on his own, but only that which he sees the Father do. Amen? He had vision. Did you know Jesus didn't have faith? He had vision. He saw. This is why when he prayed for Lazarus, remember? He said, Father, I pray this. I already know. But I pray this for their sake, that they might believe. You notice how Jesus had knowledge. They had faith. Are you all with me? This is so important. Because Christ's entire life then, from the womb to the cross and the resurrection, he merited infinitely for us. And what was he showing us? He was showing folks at St. Thomas Aquinas what it means to be a man. Amen? What does it mean to be a man? Who in the image of God, this is what we are called to do. And let's face it, guys. We image the Father better than the woman. I know we can't say that in our culture, can we? <laughs> we do. Why? Because we, this is one of the many reasons why I, I was debating a, a very famous uh, former priest, God rest his soul, Richard Sipe. Y'all remember him? From the famous snap. He was a nice guy, just, oh, sadly confused. He left, of course, his priesthood and, and, and whatnot. And I remember him saying... Tim, when I was debating him, uh, it was the priest scandals at the time going on and I, when I debated him on a radio show. He said, the church is sick. It's sick, Tim. Because right off the top, you eliminate half of your candidates for the priesthood when you eliminate women. Right? That's why the priesthood is sick. And I said, I said Richard, I think you're asking the question a little bit wrong. Would we say, um, let's think of it this way. Would we say that fatherhood is sick? Because right from the start, we eliminate half of the candidates for fatherhood. <laughs> when we eliminate women. Well, I'm sorry, but women can't be fathers. Okay? And that's not a weakness. That's a strength. Now, we're not talking about transgender here today. That would be another talk. <laughs> the insanity of transgender. The demonic 
as Pope Francis has said, this is demonic transgender. But folks, fatherhood, and it's fatherhood that we need in our culture so absolutely desperately, and it's the transgender and the homosexual, LGBTQRS, and all 62 letters now that are destroying the family, destroying the image of God the Father in our culture, and we are reaping havoc as a result. Folks, this is how we're going to restore it. Are y'all ready? Because I'm done. All right. <sighs> Point number three. Now, having learned a little bit about why God creates and a little bit about the nature of fatherhood, what it means to be a man and what it means to be a father is basically this, folks. In as much as, and I'll use my family as an example, I've got seven kids, four girls and three boys back in San Diego right now, and I know this. To the degree they see God in me will be commensurate with the degree they see my generosity. They see me on the cross. That's it, folks. In the image of God who pours himself out from all eternity, never asking for anything in, the, in return. In the image of Jesus Christ who is God manifest in the flesh. Who from the womb to the cross to the tomb and beyond pours himself out without asking anything in return. That's what fatherhood is. I'm going to conclude with this. Final point, and I wish I had time, but I don't because I went over time on my first two points, as I usually do. But I'm going to tell you a little story. Years ago, when I was in the seminary, and I studied for the priesthood for six years, get Jimmy Swagger made me Catholic, I tell you the whole story. <laughs> I spent six years in formation of the priesthood, went to St. Charles Borromeo in Philadelphia, awesome, did my philosophy there, did my theology at Mount St. Mary's, Emmitsburg, Maryland. Awesome. I had this little Franciscan nun. She was like four foot ten dynamo. And she taught me moral theology. It was one of our morals professors. And she, me being very Thomistic, she introduced me to a dude named St. Bonaventure. Never heard of him. <laughs> Read tons of him. Wow. St. Augustine. And what Sister pointed out, I'm going to share with you guys, is this. Let's try to relate everything we've heard so far and kind of bring it down and incarnate this theology in a sacrament called holy matrimony. Are you ready? The last few minutes. Are you guys ready? Are you sure? Because this is when it gets good. Well, we all know, as Sister pointed out, that the sacraments are ultimately our participation in the passion of the Lord in the first sense, this side of the veil. But of course, we participate in his life, death, burial, and resurrected life through the sacraments. But there is a primacy to the passion this side of the veil. Are you with me? Just like at the Mass. It's the holy sacrifice of the Mass. I know how we say the celebration. And that's fine. It is a celebration. But folks, as long as we're this side of the veil, it is first and principally a sacrifice. Oh, my goodness. There's more I could say there, but I can't. I don't have time. But all of the sacraments, and I'll just use one, baptism, right? It's the simplest. It's our incorporation into the death of the Lord. My goodness, right? We're buried together. Romans 6, 3. Buried together with him. Raised with him. Romans 6, 3 and 4, Right? So through the sacraments, we participate. But here's the point. We could go through all the sacraments, and it's beautiful to see how they're all a participation in the death of the Lord so we can experience a resurrected life. But I remember when I was in the seminary, it was like, how is marriage a participation in the death of the Lord? See, I wasn't married yet. My, my <laughs> wife's right here. How could that be? Because marriage is just beautiful. It's just wonderful, right? It's roses, and then I got married. And my wife's right here, so she's going to kill me. But we all know, yes, marriage is glorious and such, but it, like all the other sacraments, is first and foremost a participation in the death of the Lord. Amen? Oh, boy, yes, says all the men. And if your wives were here, they would be shouting, Amen! <laughs> but this is what she shared that I had not heard before, and I want you to take this home with you. And that is... When you look at how the sacraments work, 
They all consist of form and matter, and all are participations in the death of the Lord. Well, what's the form and matter when it comes to marriage? There's actually different theologies on this, legitimate and within Catholic parameters, right? But Sister pointed out, as St. Augustine said, and we definitely don't have time to do this, but St. Augustine famously shows that when we talk about form and matter, Christ on the cross is, and, and remember this, form and matter are basically the spiritual component and the material component, right? Form of baptism. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Spiritual component. The stuff, the water. Well, in marriage, of course, the stuff originates with Christ on the cross when he gives his body to his bride, the church. That's the material stuff he gives to his bride is his body. Amen? That's the stuff. Oh, and I, oh, I wish I had more time. I don't. But let's back up. Well, if that's kind of the matter, what's the form when it comes to Christ? Well, this is the one that blew my mind. As St. Bonaventure uh, points out and Sister Paula Jean pointed out that the form happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. When Christ in Mark chapter 14, verse 36, we all know the text. He collapses in a heap. And he prays with blood. St. Luke tells us blood pouring out of his very skin popping capillaries. His prayer was so intense. That's actually a real physical reality. The doctors will tell you that can happen. Tom Platts, the famous bodybuilder, used to do reps with a thousand pounds on his back. He would pop capillaries in his eyes during his workout. That tells you kind of the intense nature of Jesus. He was popping capillaries. He's praying. But what does he say? He says, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. At that moment, we all know, right, that Jesus was, as the catechism says in paragraph 478, taking upon himself all of our sins. He saw 100 million abortions. He saw. How does he do that? I don't know. But being God kind of helps. And having the beatific vision kind of helps in his human nature. But the fact is he experienced an agony. His survival could only be explained by angels and grace. Because his human nature couldn't have survived without them. That's how intense it was. Nevertheless, not my will. When Jesus said those words, Father, if it be possible, nevertheless, not my will. In that act of self-abnegation, grace exploded into his life, and as we've already seen, not moving him from imperfection to perfection. No, St. Thomas Aquinas says that his perfect human nature exploded with grace superabundantly. In fact, Thomas quotes John 1.16 that says, out of his perfection we receive grace upon grace. Are y'all with me? John chapter 1, verse 16. But he explo grace explodes down through the eons of time and to all of us. But grace also explodes in his human nature and empowers him to do what he cannot do, and that is go to the cross. He needed supernatural power. Well, gentlemen, I have to leave you with this because they're about to give me the hook. This is the essence of what we're called to be as men and in particular as fathers. Whether you are the priest of a parish you are a father if you are a husband. How many dads do we have in here? You are a father. Guess what you're called to do? From the day you got married, gentlemen, how many of you know you got in over your head? <laughs> Amen. You know why? Because ultimately, in marriage, we are called to get each other to heaven and to drag as many kids as we can with us. And in order to do that, we have to do something that even a perfect, and guess what? Y'all ain't perfect. I'm looking at you. I know you're not perfect. <laughs> Cannot do apart from grace. And so this is the secret. I am convinced to the healing of our culture, our church, our nation, and the world. Because my friends, let's face it, civilization is only civilization in as much as we have women. Did you know that, Dan? The feminine is the basis of civilization. You know why? Because, Dan, without women and the influence of the feminine, you know what you and I are doing? We're chasing each other around, throwing 
spears at each other. That's what we're doing. Women are the foundation of civilization, but my friends, remember this. A family, a culture, a nation, a church is only as strong as its men. And in fact, without men, you have weakness. You have what we have in Catholic culture today. You have what we have in our nation. But the key, my friends, to strengthening manhood, fatherhood, masculinity is not found in pumping iron, although it's not bad. It's not found in the boxing ring, although I argue that ain't bad either. We can argue about that later, All right? Where is it found? It's found on our knees. It's found in understanding, my friends, what the women folk already know by nature. And you and I are knuckleheads, man. It takes us, right? Because women, think about this. Women by nature receive. That's what they do. Amen. Remember I said God can't receive in a sense, right? Well, women by nature, that's what they do is they receive. You ever looked at the woman, female body? I got a wife. I can look at her body. And it's, and it's okay. Right? But she receives. Her whole body is designed to receive the seed, to nurture, to bring forth life and nurture and so forth. That's what she's made for. Amen? To receive. You and I are made to go out from ourselves. We are the transcendent authority. Amen? And we are the first cause of life in the family, as God is the first cause of all things. We are the first principle of life in the family. We go out from ourselves. Amen? So we need help when it comes to this weird stuff of receiving. But if you're going to be human, you got to receive. Amen? If you're going to get to heaven, you got to receive because you need grace. Otherwise, you ain't getting there. Amen? You're not going to make it to heaven. You're not going to be the man that God has called you to be. So we need help from the women folk, the Blessed Mother. If you are a priest, you need a devotion to the Blessed Mother or you're going to be a monster and you're not going to make it to heaven. You need the influence of the feminine, the blessed mother in your life to teach you to receive, my friends. And we need to do that. The final thing I'm going to say to you, and I am done because I'm out of time, is this, my friends. In the sacrament, when we married, when I married the most beautiful woman in the world who happens to be here right now, Valerie Staples, almost 22 years ago at St. Anne's Catholic Church in Seal Beach, California, when we exchanged vows, my friends, that is when the explosion happened. When we, take this home with you, exchange vows. You know what, in essence, this is what Sister Paula Jean shared with me through Bonaventure and St. Augustine, that when we exchange vows, we basically are with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Official witness of deacon, priest, or bishop, because it's three to get married, amen, as Bishop Sheen famously said. But we turn to each other, and we basically say to each other, not my will, but thy will be done, amen? Then my wife says, not my will, but thy will be done. And in that act of self-abnegation, we are present with Jesus in the garden. And if it is real, and we truly are denying ourselves, an explosion of grace happens and empowers us to go and, of course, we consummate where those graces are increased and perfected, and we are empowered to go to the cross. And, my friends, that is the secret of fatherhood and of being a man. It is death. It is dying for her. I said on my wedding day, I will die for you. And then I say, please, God, help me die for her. Amen? <laughs> because I know I don't have the power to do that. And should God bless us with kids, and we were blessed with seven of them, I vow to die for them as well. And you want to know something you learn about your wife and about your kids? You can't lie. I mean, guys are pretty good liars, and they can lie pretty good. It's awful hard to lie to mama and to your kids. They see you, and they know you. And the bottom line is, gentlemen, as I said at the start, I'll say at the finish. I've been finishing a while, I know. If one day, maybe I could, I could cut a little out just by saying this. If one day, gentlemen, Ivan, if one day I can hear my kids, if I stay alive long enough, if I could hear my kids say, you know what, man, dad was nuts. He was crazy. He, man, he whipped the tar out of us too, by the way. Not that I beat them badly. I mean, a couple stitches, come on. I'm joking. 
Dad, <laughs> he was a little crazy. But I'll tell you what, he sacrificed for us, man. He loved us. That man worked his tail off for us. We can never deny that. I can die and go to heaven. If my wife will testify, that man served me. He died for me. That's all I need to hear. God bless you.